Welcome back to the MetaMinds podcast, a mentoring service helping conscious people destroy their limiting beliefs so that they can lock the life of their dreams. And today we had Thane Marcus Ringler join us. Uh, he used to be a professional golfer for four years. He then took a transition into like the entrepreneurial space, creating a book, running a podcast and doing one-on-one coaching. But the thing that I really loved about this episode was that there was some actual actionable content in here. There was thoughtful responses and some practices that you guys can actually use to either tame your ego, recognize your limiting beliefs, or actually unlock your full potential. So there was a lot of wisdom in here and a lot of things that you can actually action after listening to the podcast, which I really appreciated. And something else, whenever we asked uh, questions, we actually kind of sat with those answers and you know he really kind of unpacked all of the answers rather than just giving like a quick one word response. Not that we get that often, uh, but yeah, just really enjoyed the depth that he went to in some of his answers. So let's get meta. Enjoy. Thane, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Um, really excited to learn more about uh, what's going on with you. And I guess what we'd like to start off with at the beginning of MetaMinds is to Give like a 30 second kind of 30 second kind of breakdown of who you are and kind of where you've come from and where you are now, um, just in a 30 second kind of section so that our audience can kind of get a, a grasp of who you are. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be with you both here today. Uh, I am a development coach, so I work with people on professional and personal development. I come alongside and assist them in that. Um, And really, I'm focused a lot of my time on uh, developing self-leaders, self-leadership. So if you can lead yourself well, then you can better lead others. Uh, And that's kind of the goal of what I try to do. And I believe that revolves around self-awareness and discipline. Uh, And a lot of my work stems from my background in golf and playing golf my whole life and professionally for a bit. So that's a a short snippet. Mm, Okay. So you you mentioned that that you're playing a bit of of golf that potentially would have influenced you to get into this space. Like, what did you learn from from playing golf professionally for a period then? What did that teach you? Yeah, golf's really interesting in that it is an individual sport. Um, and so really, you have to take full ownership for all the results. Uh, there's no one else to blame. There's no teammates to pass the buck off to. There's no referees. There's no coaches that you can excuse the results onto. You have to take full ownership. And that's a shot-by-shot basis. So there's every single golf shot you hit has a result. And you are the direct cause of that result. So it, it, you, te- you learn a lot about um, yourself. Uh, it grows a lot in self-awareness. Um, but then it also, you learn a lot about your mind and how it works. Because the biggest thing, once you develop a, a level of competency within your body, knowing how to make the swings and hit the shots, then it falls to your mind to be able to focus on the right things to allow your body to consistently create that result that you want, no matter the circumstances or the pressures that you're feeling surrounding you, how can you execute um, regardless of that uh, consistently every time and maximize your performance? So you learn a lot about the way your mind works and the way you're wired as a human, um, and you're exposed uh, fully to the results that come from that. Yeah, that's really cool. And no, no, I appreciate that. Thanks. So like, I guess in terms of this journey that you've gone on, like I know that now you're you're an author, you're on a podcast, you know, you've got like courses and one-to-one coaching by the looks of it as well. Like that's that's obviously quite a lot right now. And that's kind of like a fully fleshed out business. But where did it all start for you? Like obviously golf mm-hmm. seemed to be quite a personal development journey for you, but what got you into this space specifically? Yeah, it really was a a windy road. I think most of our paths in life are pretty windy. They're not very straight. A lot of times, you you know, growing up, you think there's this clear cut path to whatever uh, job or dream that I have, but it it never works out how we expect it to. And that was true for me too. I played professionally uh, golf wise for about four years. And the first half of that was really a mental struggle. And the second half was a physical struggle. So the first half was a lot of just figuring out how can I discipline my mind and overcome some of these mental weaknesses that are inhibiting my best performance. Uh, And then once I got some momentum and and learned some skills on that end, it turned into how can I solve the problem of my body and that I had a muscle strain in my left rhomboid that repeated five times over a year and a half, which was pretty uh, grueling and frustrating period. But during that time, I really started diversifying my interests a little bit more, exploring some new avenues, ended up starting a podcast with my friend at that time, um, and ended up also beginning my first book. And, and really, the impetus for the book was 
Uh, I, I wanted to be able to repay my investors and sponsors for what they'd given me in golf. I had a team of uh, sponsors that helped back me and fund that that journey. And if I couldn't repay them financially, what could I do to say thank you? And this idea for a book came from that um, desire. And, and so when I was on the injury recovery um, and I didn't want to just sit on my butt and rehab and practice putting, uh, I decided to also uh, try and puke out this first draft. So I spent three months just diving into it and trying to get these words out. Um, and that process of writing, I mean, it, the three months was a puking out of the rough draft, but then, you know, it's horrible and you have to figure out how to make something horrible, decent. <laughs> and so the next, you know, 15 months were spent on finishing the book. So it took about 18 months to get the book out and in total. Uh, but really that process of taking those experiences of a lifetime playing golf and then professionally for four years, taking those experiences and really um, making clarity of it first in my head as I'm trying to figure out what to write. And then as I write it out, I learn it again, I, I relearn it. And then I also um, create systems or models or frameworks from that that can be useful for me and then hopefully for others. So really that book was a lot of the catalyst for how my mind started putting these systems in place and started thinking about how can this provide benefit to others. Um, and then when I decided to make the transition out of golf, uh, I was sitting with this question that I, I found really helpful. And it's this question of who have I been created, equipped and called to be? And I love this question just because it's holistic in the sense that created is our natural abilities or talents uh, that we kind of have at birth that we're kind of wired with. Equipped is a lot of those life experiences of, of what have I gone through or been through my life that has taught me or informed my perspective or helped me in gain certain skills. And then called is really that passion or that desire, or that burning fire within us that won't die, that motivates us to keep moving forward to, to bring it into the world. And as I sat with that question at the end of my golf career, I really felt that I could be more effective outside the world of golf than within it. And, and that decided kind of my path. So I, I chose to pivot. And then it's a, a process of trying to figure out how to make it work. As an entrepreneur, right, you're just really trying to solve the problem of how do I make this work? How do I um, solve problems for people that I think are important while also um, earning a living off that? And, and that's a challenge always. Uh, and that's part of why I love it is that I love the challenge of trying to figure that out and make sense of it. Um, and so it's been a windy path ever since. And, you know, all those things you mentioned earlier, um, it's you can't do all of those things at once, right? So I think it's always one step and it adds this piece and then you take another step and it adds another piece. And, and by the time you've made 10, 20, 30 steps, you have a lot of pieces that are like, wow, I can't believe all these pieces are here, but they don't just happen overnight. And it doesn't happen all at the same time, I guess is the best way to say it. That's awesome, man. There's a lot to unpack there. I think like with that question, I think it's really powerful because you've obviously like really thought about each individual word there and how important each of those words, you know, it's not just a random question. You'd be like, what's my purpose or whatever. Like each individual word, like really kind of counts and, and alludes to what the, what the larger picture is. And we're all about that. You know, it's like, you've got to really pay attention to what you're actually asking. Otherwise it's like, mm. everything's just a bit random, you know? And so to extract kind of what you were saying about the book there, we kind of feel the same about the podcast. Actually, it, we're kind of like, we treat it as like hacking our way to success based on, you know, the, the wisdom that we learn from the people along the way. And then we turn that into something creative and wrap it in, in something that is, um, you know, palatable for, for other people to actually consume and benefit from. Um, so it's really cool. I think there's a lot of similarities between what we're doing. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask was like, you know, you're doing a lot of these things for other people. And obviously you mentioned that, you know, you want to make a living in the process as well. But from that transition to golf, like that's obviously kind of a self-motivated, like it's just a single person kind of thing. Like what is the actual deep underlying motivator for doing the things that you're doing now, like for, for taking some of the actions that you're taking to help other people? Like, can you kind of pinpoint what it is that's actually motivating you to do it? Yeah. You know, I, as I've, as I've kind of gone um, on this path, I think we learn by doing, right? So as you guys are talking about, right, we learn by the, the steps we take. We don't learn before we take the steps. I think that's really important, right? We learn in the process. So I love that you mentioned that. Uh, I definitely agree. And, and for me, as I've gone on it, I've realized my purpose is I want to see more people um, take ownership and never settle is kind of the phrase I like to use. And what I mean by that is uh, there's a lot of people, my, my calling or my desire, my motivation is for people in life that have kind of their survival needs are taken care of. So they're, they're, 
they're not necessarily fighting to just survive or put food on the table, but they're at a place where they're just kind of existing above that. And meaning they're not really making much of their existence beyond just surviving other than consuming or finding pleasure or whatever it is that they enjoy doing. They're not really making much of it. And so I really feel called to those people kind of in that middle tier of saying, look, there's so much more that you can be bringing into the world for the good of those around you. And, and we as humans, I think, have a responsibility to do that. We are relational beings. We I think we've been created for relationship with one another. Um, if you're alone by yourself, you end up getting pretty depressed and full of despair because we're made, you know, and COVID's been tough for that because we don't have as much human interaction because we're made for it. Um, and so those people that are in that middle tier, I want them to take ownership, meaning like take ownership of your thoughts, actions, behaviors, and the things that you're experiencing in life. Because a lot of times we excuse, we all default to it, blaming others and excusing what we experience onto the circumstances or um, the people and other decisions made that weren't our duty. So uh, the first step is always taking ownership, which takes a level of self-awareness. And the second step is just committing to never settling. Because as humans, we all default to the path of least resistance. So if we don't make a choice, we choose to go downstream. And downstream, the path of least resistance isn't going to be what's best for us or for others around us. It never produces the best results for either party. Um, And so that takes discipline. Uh, Discipline is the thing that helps us go upstream. Uh, And, you know, that's ultimately saying, I'm going to row the boat, which is effort. And I'm going to have a really compelling reason why, which is the intention piece. Because if you don't have an intention behind rowing, you're going to get tired and be like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm just going to keep going downstream. Uh, So I think that effort and intention, which is what discipline is, Mm -hmm. is really important. Um, And so that's kind of where I've, over the three, four years of of going into this work, I've realized that that's kind of what I'm all about. I really feel passionate about those things because for me as a golfer, playing professional golf forced me to embrace those mindsets. Because if I wasn't going to take ownership for my results, no one else would. And my, my success would never happen. And, and really from a result standpoint, I didn't have the success I wanted to, I didn't reach the PGA tour. Like my goal was, uh, yet it prepared me for all the things I'm doing today. So the point of that to say is that it doesn't have to turn out exactly how you imagine, but if you do it to the best of your ability and you're taking ownership and never settling, it will lead to what's next, even if it's not what you expected. Yeah. Wow. Love that, man. That's, that's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think the thing I'm really curious about, so like we talk a lot about limiting beliefs on, um, on metaminds and that could be a belief system that, you know, you're not capable of doing something or you'll never become like a, a pro golfer, for example. Um, and I guess like for you, I can, I can see that you're very aspirational and you've, you've obviously done a lot, but you know, in the early phases of you getting into golf, I'm sure there was some limiting beliefs around how, how would I become a professional golfer? Um, mm-hmm. And I guess that's something that we notice a lot of our, our clients and a lot of people that we surround ourselves, or we, we, you know, we've had interactions with. Um, there are a lot of limiting beliefs that stop us from actually like unlocking our full potential and achieving mm-hmm. um, potentially something that we are definitely capable of achieving. So um, like for you, can you remember in those early phases what those conversations were like with this, this limiting self that we all probably have inside of Mm -hmm. us and like what helped you get through that? Yeah. Well, I I love that you bring that up. It's so true. And you know, they don't just go away either. We get better at facing them or recognizing them, but it's a practice. I think we're going to be in our entire lives uh, because they do pop up. And so even today I face that. Um, And I think one of the ones I experienced more recently that is very true that I experienced early on is this um, this limiting belief that says, I'm not going to let myself entertain um, the real goal of what I'm trying to do. Like the like as a kid, it was, for instance, at, in high school, my trajectory was improving. I was doing really well in junior golf and, and it looked good for my future potential. Uh, and so my dad was always like, well, one day maybe you can play on the tour, you know, and, all, and getting really excited. I'm like, dad, easy. There's a lot of steps before we get there. And, I, you know, I got to keep growing and improving. So I was much more of the pragmatic or realist. And my dad was more of the dreamer. But in, inside, I wanted that. But I didn't want um, to set myself up for failure or set myself up to be let down based on my expectations of myself. And so it was this fear of um, not reaching the expectations or goals 
uh, that I had set before me that kept me from really embracing that dream as a possible reality. Uh, and I really didn't embrace it until late in college uh, because of that fear and limiting belief that um, that's scary and that's um, going to be really hurtful if I actually don't do it. And if I planned on it, I'll be really let down and super bummed. And really, a lot of it, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Enneagram at all, but I'm a three on the Enneagram. It's kind of a personality type tool. And it's a little bit older than a lot of the other ones, but it's re re a resurgence now. And the three on the Enneagram is the achiever. And, and America is very filled with achievement. It's achievement-based culture. Everyone's trying to achieve something. Um, and so as a three in America, I'm very achievement wired. I get a lot of fulfillment from accomplishing things or um, trying to achieve things. So I can see where this fear comes from more naturally for me and, and for other people like me that, that a lot of times we don't let ourselves entertain the hopes and dreams that we have because of the fear that we won't accomplish it, the fear that we won't achieve those lofty heights that we set before us. Um, and that holds us back. And, you know, even, even now I had a conversation, um, with a guy this last week and there's a new, a newer coaching program that I'm, I'm wanting to get off the ground. It's combining golf, my background in golf and my background in development coaching and kind of pairing the two in a one day development solution. And I haven't really been getting it off the ground. I haven't been really focused on prioritizing that. And part of it is because it's, a niche hard thing to do to get off the ground. And, and it's again, that same mindset of, man, I don't want to believe that this is going to be what's next because if it doesn't happen, I'll be disappointed, you know? And, and so even now I'm facing that coming up in different ways and arenas. And, and I think it's really great that you brought that up because it's a practice. I really think it's, it's never going to be a destination where we have zero that ever affect us. It's a practice of recognizing and working through and uh, I'm reframing those perspectives. It's great to see that you're not uh, trying to come off as like, yeah, I've got it all figured out because, you know, sometimes we see, you know, a lot of people on podcasts and that's the way that they're coming off and it's just not real and people can't relate to it, you know, because then they feel that way and they're like, how am I ever going to get to that stage, you know? And it sounds like, you know, there's a, there's a hint of kind of self-sabotage there as well. And I noticed that I do that myself as well. Both Dan and I are probably in that, in that kind of achievement category as well. We find fulfillment in doing things, even if it's little things, you know, we're not having a productive day even for doing like tiny little things. We still feel like we're like, oh yeah, taking something off. You know? <laughs> but often it's like when there is a big thing like that, for example, it's very niche. So it's like, oh, but so if I think that I want to achieve that, then I don't achieve it. Then, you know, it's going to be too hard. And then, you know, I'll be disappointed or whether there's definitely some self-sabotage in there. Cause you're like, I won't even start. It's all good. I'll just do something else kind of thing. So that's another interesting thing that your ego can kind of, do is just kind of like stop you before you even start doing it, which kind of yeah. entangles with limiting beliefs there. So just to dive into that ego element a little bit more, like you've kind of mentioned that, you know, it's a practice of observation and that's really cool. I suppose like, I'd love to know any other kind of practices you have around either taming or recognizing or, you know, getting through your ego when it's actually kind of stopping you doing what you actually want to do. Because I think that's a really important part in the things that we're trying to do here, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it really is. You know, I think this idea of self-sabotage is really helpful because I think the way we do it is by self-protection. Uh, I think we are really trying to protect ourselves um, and we feel like we are under attack. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why, at least in my experience or as I've thought about it, is we attach our identity to what we do instead of who we are. Uh, and when we attach our identity to that, right, then like for me, if as a golfer, if I'm a professional golfer and I fail at golf, then I am a failure, right? So when that's attached, then we get in a lot of trouble of like, it, it, those defeats are that much more crushing. They feel that much more personal and it feels um, like we're in a hole that we're never going to climb out of. Uh, it's just a, a reality that we live in now. Uh, so I think the first step for all of us, myself included, is just saying, okay, wh what is my identity? My identity is a human being. And my identity as a human being does not depend on what I do for work, what I look like, what I say. It's, it's simply there's worth and value as humans inherent to us. And I'm, I'm a Christian, so a lot of my faith informs that too. Um, I, I think that God's created humans and, and, he's, and everyone's the image bearer of God, so they have divine worth and value. And everyone's a sinner, so they fall short, meaning no one's better than the rest. So I think we're all in the same plane in that sense. I think we can see each other the same way. Um, and so I think identity is like the first part of that, at least in my mind, of how can I daily practice that? And I'm not 
any better than anyone else at that, right? And talking about it with you guys helps me be like, oh yeah, I need to work on my identity on a daily basis of like, yeah, what is my true identity as a human being? Not what do I need to accomplish for my career and goals and work? Uh, And so that's a great practice on a daily level. And um, when I work with clients, a lot of times uh, getting a vision statement or identity statement of who we are, who we feel we called to be, um, getting that visible to where we can see that more consistent on a daily level is something that's really helpful. Um, and then the other thing that, that came to mind is, um, I think uh, one of the things that, uh, it's a quote, I think, from James Clear, uh, who said, not taking things personally is a superpower. Um, and I think that's really a simple way to say, like, we often self-sabotage because we take a lot of things personal. Um, when really it's just feedback on what's working and what's not. It's not personal. It's just simply like a computer telling you, okay, this path is better than this path, or this isn't going to work, or this is, you know? And so if we can make things less personal and just use it as a feedback um, system of saying, okay, here's what's not helpful, here's what is, and here's what's working, here's what's not, uh, that'll help us a lot more uh, be less derailed from those times when we do self-sabotage or we do get a rejection or uh, something doesn't go our way, which is life. Um, and and um, and it helps us keep us motivated and keep moving forward on track. And the last thing I'll say that, um, again, this isn't as practical, this is more theoretical, but the idea uh, from Nassim Tlaib's book, Anti-Fragile, I think is really helpful. Um, he, he, the book is a great, it's a long read, but it's a great book and a great idea on what our goal should be as, as humans. It should be to become more anti-fragile, which is to say, not necessarily becoming more durable or resilient, uh, which is kind of the middle ground, but becoming uh, humans that benefit from chaos. Meaning like when there's change and chaos, you actually get better, you grow stronger. Uh, And that's a great way to approach, you know, even a year like this last year in COVID that there's so much change, there's so much challenge for everyone around the world, but how can we see it as making us stronger? And how can we see it as an environment where we can actually prosper in and be anti-fragile. So we're not, we're the complete opposite of fragility in that we're actually benefiting from the chaos. Uh, and I thought that was a really good concept to, to approach times where there's going to be a lot of change, there's going to be a lot of hardship. Uh, and for me, I, I moved to a new city and got married in March of this last year in the midst of all the change. So it was like change heaped on change. And that idea of, of it being an adventure instead of um, a challenge was was a really helpful reframe for me to kind of grow in anti-fragility this last year. Yeah, there's, there's so much in there to unpack, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a lot. I think the thing that like stood out for me and what you were saying there was, you know, the idea of like trying not to take things personally. And I think that's such an ego response to react to something because you identify with something. Mm. And I guess... From my understanding, the only way we can truly kind of experience consciousness is to be present in the moment and, and not to react to it, just let it pass and, and just mm-hmm. be present with the emotion, you know, recognizing that they, that may have triggered you, but recognizing that it's probably not relevant for me to react to that in a, mm-hmm. an aggressive or, or a neg- negative kind of way. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot in there and I really appreciate you actually kind of breaking that down because it's something I don't think we've had with many guests who have really- Yeah, it wasn't just a simple answer. The you actually like went into it. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, so just to kind of change gears a little bit, like, um, you know, you spoke about being a high achiever and, um, or, you know, feeling like you kind of get fulfillment in achievement. And that's something that I know Eamon and I both kind of had. It's a curse and a blessing. Like, it's something that's amazing yeah. to have that drive and to want to do things, but it can also be quite uh, confronting if you try to relax or sit back. So- um, I guess within the idea of like flow and getting to like a psychological peak level where you do kind of feel fulfilled in a day, mm-hmm. do you have any practices or strategies around achieving that psychological peak? Yeah, totally. I, I like it because this gets them more practical, right? We're kind of theoretical and, and this will get much more to the practical level. And in the way I, I, I've thought about it, is um, in, in terms of self-awareness, I think self-awareness is one key component we've talked about a little bit, but um, the process of self-awareness, I, I, I just describe it as uh, a threefold process. It's pretty simple and it's not anything new, but um, it's, it's past, present, future. So I say discovering, understanding, and then optimizing. And so, um, you know, we need to spend time in each of those phases 
And what that looks like discovering is looking back at what we've done in certain situations, why we did it and what resulted from it, right? Processing what's happened already. So we discover who we are by reflecting on what's transpired. And that's the primary tool that I think is helpful for that is just simply journaling and reflecting, you know, sitting with a pen and a paper and saying, okay, I'm feeling this from this situation and this is what happened and this is why, and these are all the factors involved, you know, and we learn so much about that. And then you get into the understanding phase is much more of like, okay, in this conversation right now with you guys, I, you know, had this thought or I heard this noise and looked out the window and I got distracted and now I'm, I'm lost my train of thought, right? And so being able to understand yourself is saying, oh, I recognize that in the moment it happens, I need to stop looking out the window um, and focus on this conversation so I don't get distracted, right? That's the understanding in the moment as it happens. And then the um, optimizing is saying, looking to the future and saying, okay, I know in these situations, I typically act like this, but I'd rather act like this. And so I'm going to prime myself or prepare myself for that situation so I can be the person that I want to be. Uh, and I think those are the three kind of processes or levels of self-awareness. And really, I really view it as a practice. It's not a destination. We don't become self-aware. We're just practicing self-awareness, kind of like meditation. You don't reach a, a guru level of meditation by achieving it. You just keep practicing it, you know? Uh, and, and I think the same is true with self-awareness. Um, so approaching the practice of self-awareness, I, I think now that I'm married, I have feedback covered. I, I, the three primary tools in self-awareness, I didn't share this, that I think are the most helpful are journaling, reflecting, um, feedback from another human, ideally, and then um, meditation. So I think those three tools, we, when using those uh, consistently, we will naturally grow in self-awareness and practice it. And now that I'm married, I have a wife who helps me with a lot with feedback. And that's amazing, you know, to have a human that I live with now that's giving me feedback on a daily basis. I've learned so much about myself um, and it's been so helpful. And then the other really practical thing that I love is just simple idea of bookends. Having bookends to your day is so helpful for what's within those bookends to be uh, successful, as most successful as possible. So to get in a flow state, I, I really like having a consistent wake-up time. Uh, for me, that's about 5.30, uh, give or take, depending on if I'm working out in the morning. Um, and then I like to have the first hour to two hours be my quiet time, my uh, spiritual time, uh, my reading time, and, and it may entail prayer or meditation. Those are a little different form, um, but I use both of those, uh, as well as um, time in, in the Bible, time um, in other books that I'm reading, um, and then even just some journal time or quiet time. And, and having, while I don't have something I do every day in that space, I have the structure set for it there. And it can then be flexible within that structure of what I feel I need. Uh, and I've found that to be really helpful because then once I've done that and if I've gotten a workout in the morning, I've won the day and everything else is just, you know, the cherry on top in that sense, uh, because those are the ultimate priorities for me. Uh, and then once I get into the work, the thing I found really helpful is actually um, there's this little it's on the desk back here, but uh, it's a little card with some um, priorities. It's called analog. There's a great designer here named Jeff Sheldon uh, who created it. It's a simple priority prioritization tool, but I like having something like that, that is um, physical and not virtual. A lot of times if we have, when I have it on my phone, I create too many priorities. I make the list too long and I set myself for failure because then it's like, you know, I'm expecting much and I don't have enough time and then I'm stressed out and then I don't accomplish all the things and I feel bad. And that was self-inflicted. <laughs> so it allows me to have a more smaller list that um, that is something physical that I don't have to check the phone for. And then it helps me stay on track for the day as well. Uh, and then Pomodoro Technique is a great uh, strategy as well. That 25, 30 minutes on, five minutes off. It allows you to really um, be hyper-focused and kind of get in that flow state when, you're, when you need to because there's going to be a break, a short break coming up to go to the bathroom or check your phone real quick or whatever you need to do. So those are some strategies that I found to be really effective. Nice. There's a lot in that. And yeah, I love the, the practicalness of it. I just want to ask quickly, do you know uh, Donald Miller? Yes. Are you a big fan of him? Yeah, he's got great stuff. I, you know, I think he, he hits it really home well, um, and he's really practical too. I think he's down to earth with, with how he communicates. Just like, yeah, but based on a lot of the stuff that you're saying, I'm, I'm picking up kind of hints of, of stuff that he says a lot. And I'm a huge fan of Donald Miller, honestly. Like a lot of my 
uh, obviously personal growth, but also marketing, kind of a lot of the whole business side of it kind of comes from a lot of his wisdom. And yeah, I think it's really amazing kind of what he's doing. So for anyone out there that doesn't know what we're talking about, definitely check out Donald Miller because it dives into some of the stuff that we're talking about here in much more depth. And a lot of his stuff is really high quality as well. So mm -hmm. totally love that. Great. So we probably will round it out pretty soon. Um, one question that I've, I've actually seen popping up a bit, which I think is kind of an interesting one. Like, obviously, you've been on lots of other podcasts, I'm sure, and you run your own podcast as well. Like, is there a question that doesn't get asked that you would actually mm. like to answer? You know, is there something that just doesn't come up and something that you feel like you'd like to share? You know, one of the, I, I love good questions. So um, this is more on the vein of questions. And I think you guys will appreciate that. This, some of my favorite questions are, like you said, the ones that aren't asked as much. And one that I've only, I've heard asked once, and then I haven't heard it asked again, but it's also one that's super hard to answer. And that's why it often isn't asked is, um, what what do you believe to be true now? That's most, what, what out of what, out of what you believe to be true now, what is most likely wrong? Um, and I'm like, man, so I'd love to hear, I mean, put you guys on the spot here, but if you guys had to, if either of you had to answer that, how would you answer that question? So out of what we believe to be true now, what is most likely to be wrong? Yeah. That, that's a really good self development Ooh. exercise. That is. <laughs> well, like I believe that Dan's pretty cool and that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, that, that is a good one. It's probably going to yeah. take, uh, about a minute of thinking or so. Yeah. Do you have an answer for that? What do you think? Tricky one. I would say, um, you know, I, honestly, I, this is more personal for where I'm at right now, but I think um, a lot of my background in growing up in a certain uh, sect, sector of faith has informed um, a certain view of God that is, um, I think, too small. And I've been realizing that, but I don't know to what extent that is. <laughs> so I think, I, I really think like some of my views about God are wrong probably. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know necessarily which ones right now, but, um, and it's not necessarily true that that's more existential. Like we aren't gonna really know the answers ever to that, but, um, Either way, yeah, that that's keeps it with an open mind, I suppose. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I suppose like for me, like, this, you know, going back to this theme of limiting beliefs that we have here on MetaMinds, like if I was to choose a personal one, it would most likely be a limiting belief, you know? So like yeah. we like truly believe that, you know, everyone can live their dream life and the thing that's stopping them from getting that is limiting beliefs, right? And so we both kind of reached a dream life peak relatively recently. And then so obviously you reframe what your dream life looks like and then you start working towards your goals so you can achieve that dream life. Um, and so in my new dream life, like uh, like goals, what I've written down essentially, we have these life systems. And I honestly believe that I'm most likely limiting myself in that. And it goes back to what you were saying before, Thane, is that um, you know basically I'm afraid to commit to something larger than that because what if I don't achieve that? Then I'll oh, know it'll be you know sad or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think I'm probably undervaluing what my dream life is and what I actually can achieve. Um, yeah, obviously that's a very personal one, but mm. it would definitely be relevant to everyone else because everyone's like, oh yeah, maybe I can you know do this, but it's like you can probably do ten times more that more than that. You just have to figure out how to actually do that. So yeah, mm. without getting too specific on exactly what my dream life looks like or whatever, that's essentially what what uh, how I would answer that question. Yeah. Mm. How about you, Dan? Hit us with it. <laughs> I think that what you just said kind of resonates with me, but I guess that's because we talk quite a lot about that in particular. Um, I think for me, like I'm a very optimistic person about a lot of things, and I think sometimes I deny maybe the pessimism in life or I deny the fact that, um, you know, it's amazing to aspire to do massive things and, and it's achievable and anyone can do that. But maybe just the fact that I need to accept that, you know, there, there are more bad things that can happen and the path will constantly change. And no matter how clear your intentions are, really anything is possible. And at any point that could shift, you know, your world could be flipped upside down. I think maybe mm. I'm a little ignorant to that sometimes, a little too optimistic. That's what we're taking from this dude. You need to be more negative. Well, I think more realistic, <laughs> more, more realistic. Because like, 
there's a di- like being overly optimistic. Yeah, no, he is. Yeah. Sorry, he is. He is. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> whenever I come out, with, come at him with like something like like a limited belief or man, I'm feeling this way. He always hits me with, yeah, but what about this? And hits me with a positive perspective, and it's like I love it. But can you just let me have this one? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know. I'm, I'm. I share that with you, Dan, for sure. And my wife is kind of on the other side, which is a great balance. You need both, right? You really do. Yeah, well, I, I suppose and, that's a really uh, perfect way to kind of to kind of end it. I suppose we all kind of answered that question ourselves. I suppose just uh, any kind of parting wisdom, Dan. You've obviously yeah given us a lot of value and a lot to think about. I'll definitely be rewatching this one. Um, but yeah, any kind of uh, parting value or, or wisdom that you might want to share with our audience. You know, two things I've been thinking about a lot. I guess that are on my mind. So I think it might be worth others thinking about some more too. Is well, first would be just the cry for the rally cry for self leadership and focusing on that because, you know, I think we all want to become leaders often, uh, but we don't necessarily want to do the the hard work of leading ourselves well first. Um, so, you know, we're gonna we're gonna benefit so much more by working on becoming good leaders of ourselves before we ever start leading or influencing others. Um, and you know, I've experienced personally uh, the detriment that happens when you're leading others, but you're not leading yourself well, it, it ends up in a disaster a lot of times. And I experienced that when I was um, leading the golf team in college, I made some bad decisions that affected the whole team. And, you know, it caused a lot of pain and broken trust. And so we're always gonna be better off when we start with ourselves. Um, and so I just want to, uh, you know, encourage others alongside myself that if, you know, if we can't live out what we want others to, then, then we got to start with us again. Uh, and the other thing that I was going to say that has been on my mind a lot is thinking more long term. You know, I think, Dan, you were kind of probably alluding this a little bit with the, the optimism and maybe feeling I need to be a little more realistic because I'm the same way of like the sky's the limit. Um, everyone has limitless potential. And, you know, all these you, you see things through a certain lens. But a lot of that is because we've been blessed to have experiences that haven't been as hard as other people yet, you know, and um, and in the fact that there is. Um, good and evil in the world and there's a lot of amazing things that happen there's a lot of horrible things that happen to people um and that's a part of life and existence it's it's been making me think more long term i guess the way to say it and and i want to be thinking more about i actually had a couple grandparents pass away this last year and with that you know hearing their legacy and the impact they had on their children their grandchildren and the people in their community it just really re-inspired me to say you know it's not about what I can accomplish in this year or the next year. It's about what kind of legacy can I leave for the generations to come. And and honestly, in our stage of life, in our young to mid young years, we are often much more short term thinking because we haven't lived as long. But how can we start as a generation collectively start thinking more what's sustainable, uh, what will have generational impact and how can we leave a hundred year legacy instead of just one year? Great, man. No, I really appreciate all your thoughtful responses. And I think there's a lot to think about in there, a lot for people to unpack. So, yeah, I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you so much, Thane, for all your your wisdom and, and answers throughout this podcast, man. Thanks, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, wish you guys the best with all the new things coming out, too. It's going to be exciting to watch.